Hey guys, Boy here, and this is Things I Learned with Yapsource Rubik in 7.11. I know that 7.12 just came out, but there's very little changes to Rubik, so please bear with me. As of always, I want to remind you guys that I'm streaming every day, beat casting or playing. This weekend before the AC starts, we'll have a drunk 1k MMR cast, so if you're into that, please tune in. We finally got a Discord group, I highly suggest you guys join it. There, you can submit replays for the 1k MMR casts, and if you're a Twitch sub, you can submit replays for the MMRs Just a Number series. If you never heard of it, here's one episode for you. But please watch this video first. That being said, let's begin. The first thing I really want to talk about is how Yapsur shows mid for a brief second and then gives the call for his team to fight bottom. Tusk and Puck are relatively elusive at level 1 because of their cooldowns, and by telling his team to fight, he can show up later with telekinesis without the chance of dire escaping, and since Tusk commits pretty hard here, they end up getting the kill. Oftentimes you see people showing up first and then committing all their spells, but baiting like this, especially when Rubik shows mid for a second, can work wonders, because Radiant doesn't have that much disable with a level 1 void. Also, note how Yapsor gives the call that Tusk is missing since he doesn't TP bottom immediately. Being a support is all about coordinating and giving insight to your team. He keeps on pressuring Puck, but I want to mention something that Yapsor does constantly the entire laning stage, scouting the bottom room. A lot of supports just care about the bounties, but he makes sure to check if there's a rune bottom to help out other lanes not being ganked. He immediately immediately pins the top rune and goes back to zoning bottom. That insight helps Tinker getting it, not only giving him lane advantage, but last chance of dying in case Tusk finds it. The way Yapsur uses his pals and right clicks is also super efficient. A lot of people just show up and use telekinesis instantly, but he goes with a right click first, then walks forward knowing that this is the direction as far will jaunt away, and only then uses the disable, securing extra right clicks for everyone. If you remember, Tusk was bottom a couple of seconds ago, but he ended up disappearing. Yapsur understands that they have very little little kill potential bottom, so instead of waiting for Tusk to show up in a lane and then burn through his TP, he walks towards mid, he confirms his hunt with a scan, and that play alone forces a TP from a dire support while the Yapsur has his. Pretty crispy actually. Something we really need to talk about is career priority. As you see, that mid rotation from Yapsur ends up serving two purposes. If you watch him here, it feels like he doesn't know where to go, but in reality he was waiting for his mid to use the courier so that he can get a clarity that he bought zero minutes in after the bounty. Can you see how little priority priority he gives to his items, he sees Tusk top and knowing that going bottom doesn't yield him a kill and that his team can get the bottom bounty, he goes top to protect the low HP Enigma while also getting another bounty for him. Tusk tries to contest it and I want to show you how good his kill usage is. As you can see Tusk is getting there slightly before bounty time, which means that they will trade hits, so he uses the Fate Bow instantly. A lot of people think that this is only a nuke that you use to get kills for yourself, but it reduces right click damage, and even though Rubik is a one armor hero, he can trade just fine with Tusk under these circumstances. A level 2 Tusk right clicks for 55 damage, and with Fate Bow level 1, you're going to reduce that by 20, which means he's pretty much right clicking for half the damage, and that allows him to trade pretty well with him. See how long he's holding on to the lift? Tusk got into a pretty sticky situation, and Yapsor can hold the lift until he really tries to disengage. By holding into the disable and using the Fate Bow to get good trades, he snatches the bounty and get the kill at the same time. While his team goes on Puck bottom, Yapsur probably wanted to use the orb cooldown to harass us far, but a wild Tusk shows up. Pay attention how he tries to get away from this situation. Note that right here, Tusk and Puck are not close enough so that the Fate Bolt bounces, so he keeps disengaging, and what he really wants is to hit both to stand a chance of survival against those right clicks or at least survive as long as possible. Only when they get close he commits it, but there's no way he would have lived, but at least he bides a little bit more time. But again, notice how he utilized Fate Bolt early on to make up for Rubik's terrible armor, HP and moves. When he dies, he doesn't commit a TP to any lanes. Rubik is a great counter initiator with TPs, so burning a TP when nothing has happened can really reduce this hero's potential in the next 80 seconds. And in a high MMR game like this, this will be abused. Seeing how low HP OD is, he walks to that lane, but notice how his camera hover over every single lane to see what's up. He pings bottom so that his allies start fighting, and with the copyrighted Yapsur Fate Bolt, he secures Raid in a Tusk.
Notice that since he doesn't have gold for arcanes right away, he goes bottom to check the rune, pings that the rune is top, and then comes back to buy arcanes. He wants to engage for this area, so waiting there would be a waste of time. And you might be like, yeah, I mean, that fate boat before I wouldn't change much, and yeah, he just bought three seconds, but when you add all of that up, you get like one minute, two minutes in a 40 minute game, and that's a lot. That's like the difference from being level 19 to level 20, or from having a pretty big item, or, or no go to that item. He gives mana to his friendos, and now I want to show you how a support job is not only safeguarding your cores or gank the mid lane. This is catapult wave time, so pay attention how Yapsor wants to use the fact that they zone S4 out of the lane to do as much damage as possible. A lot of supports just think about their items or pools and ganks and forget that they can help taking the tower. Yes, they can't really kill Puck, but by staying there and zoning the Puck before the creeps get close to the tower, as well as forcing the orb usage, look what he achieves. First, he looks around the map to gauge whether there are more heroes close to Puck, then look what he does. Orb is about to get back on cooldown and by diving Puck here, he cannot draw aggro with the orb and that by itself will give them more than 50% damage on that tower. This is not a pull, this is not a kill, but working together with your teammates and securing objectives can be as effective. After Puck is out, look how he pings the catapult so that Void Tank's tower hits until the creep wave arrives and they get pretty lucky. One thing I want to touch upon is the Absor going arcanes. A lot of the times it's safer and less greedy to go with Trancos just because of the move speed to steal spells, but against OD I do feel like being greedy and getting arcanes is great. The mana drain from the hammer and the arcane orb is quite strong and having that extra AoE mana for your team can help quite a bit. As 10 minutes approaches, notice how he starts to cap the mid lane. As a support, it's always good to identify which lanes will be empty at this stage so that you can get your level 6 or the gold for the tome as fast as possible. Tinker is a well-known jungler at this stage and thus Yapsor makes that lane his home. It's interesting to note that his bottom lane had two fights in a row that they lost and Rubik did not show up, even though he had mana and TP available. Rubik is a very greedy support and trying to engage in fights where only a few of your teammates are brawling without level 6 can put you in an even more disadvantageous position. He gets his level 6 and instead of reacting, he smokes with his team. That's a great power spike since both Visage and Rubik got level 6 and they fight Morphling. Pay attention to how Yapsor plays this. After stealing a spell, he places himself in the high ground. After all, any other direction that Morph waveforms to is on the Radiant side of the map, so it's easier to chase him. So that's the only real safe way he can get out. So that was pretty nice. He also goes to zero agility. Never go full agility, guys. This fight is great, not only because of Yapsor. Visage was just chilling and suddenly the OD starts chasing Visage super hard at night time. So note how Visage wards immediately. At night time in a place like this, it's likely that Dyer has a ward, so at least you know what you're getting into if you try to fight. If let's say four heroes showed up after that ward, at least Visage's cores wouldn't die if they try to help. Anyways, note how Yapsor postures here. If OD is going that crazy, maybe or most likely there are more enemies there, so he hides, and thanks to that ward, he can lift OD towards S4, even though he doesn't hit him, that was pretty cool. It's also worth noting how since he needs to aim in the OD, he doesn't orb with his mouse close to his hero to then move the hands to steal a spell. He orb with the mouse onto the OD to steal the Astro instantly. See how he postures as the Astro ends? He wants to be as close to OD and as far away from Puck as possible. S4 does a great job silencing him, but Yapsor was well positioned and they take the OD as well as Shadow Shaman. Pretty crispy fight. In this other clip, and before we start, I want you to know that Void has way less farm than Morphling, so this is a risky fight. Stuff was going on top, so maybe Yapsor felt like they were fine here. He does a great job of breaking the Lincolns to be able to lift Morph, but maybe using spell steel was not the greatest idea, since he only has 3 agility at this point. The fact is, he cannot help his Void with those spells, so he does the best he can. He fade bolts the wave in hopes it reduces Dyer's hero's damage and runs away. Note how much space he creates though. He morphs all the agility. When he sees the shards flying out, he already starts running top, or else he'll get stuck and probably die. and he also runs towards this side of the trees because Shadow Shaman won't have vision. Morphling waveforms and he remembers about the Lincolns in time to break it with the Fate Bolt while lifting Morphling and in time to waveform away because he actually broke the Lincolns before using spells. That being said, it doesn't look good for the Radiant side. But look how he keeps on trying to create as much space as possible. If he can damage or annoy anyone without risk of dying, he'll do it. He doesn't just walk back to base, he pushes the lane, he always tries his best to not let kills become more objectives. I mean, the tier 1 was that anyways, but he doesn't want to take tier 2 damage.
and look what a beautiful play. Pretty much everyone from Raiden is farming until they get a glimpse of Morph pushing top. Black Hole is ready, and what they really lack is a reliable disable against Morph's Lincolns. Well, with Waveform, look how he ups or initiates here. First, he engages from the trees, then he waveforms, breaks the Lincolns with spell steal this time because he wants to keep that spell and they need as much damage as possible. And while Morphling was able to morph strength with telekinesis, they set up the black hole. Seconds after that, his Tinker gets engaged, and note that Coil gets used. Yapsur feels like he can burst the OD, but he refrains from stealing something or casting telekinesis because he probably felt scared against the Puck Plus Tusk, and he almost gets it. Look how he gets out of this though. Coil is down, as well as the Walrus Punch, and as he disengages from the shards, note how he's already clicking on Puck. By clicking the Astro even outside of range, Puck is unable to cast anything or silence him since Rubik has no cast point and he instant TPs out. Pretty crispy. You can see that he was able to create a lot of plays without Blink Dagger. When I see Lomimar players trying the hero out, everyone feels like you either need first item force or first item Blink Dagger and that's not the case at all times. Against heroes like Morphling Tusk, trying to initiate with a support means dying every fight. So Yapsur tries to get more move speed with the U Scepter that also gives him the Dispel, another TP cast cancel and another Lincoln's Breaker. Force Staff wouldn't be bad, but it doesn't give you mana region and Yapsur is a pretty greedy player. He wants to be able to push waves constantly with Fake Bolt and farm a little bit. This is one of the crispiest plays I've ever seen, but it will be long, so bear with me. It all starts in this bottle engagement. Enigma gets exploded, and again we see the same Fable Lift being used. As the lift is about to end, notice how he silences Morphling, but what I wanted to take out of this fight is that Radiant cannot fight without Black Hole or Chrono. Chrono is on cooldown and Enigma is dead, so note how Rubik doesn't commit here. Obviously, dying as a support is never as bad as dying as a core, but every death needs to have a purpose, and here there's none. There are no Dragon Balls to revive Enigma, and as he disengages, notice the Tinker gets stuck. I can see players trying to dive and use Scepter the Shadow Shaman or silence him, but it's impossible for Yapsur to do anything here. He doesn't go back to base, but he also doesn't commit. Fade Boat flies out, and notice how he keeps using the tree's vision and his allies' vision to cast spells without showing. S4 is on to him, but with his silence, he's able to repel him. Somehow, Tinker survives, and then, since he keeps on using the trees to walk around, he steals Coil. Everything starts with this Coil still. And the important part to take away from this first part is that it's not because you can't commit that you need to disengage the fight completely. Clearly, being able to stay in the outskirts of the fight and actually get something done can be huge, and this coil still was great. For some time, Yapsur pretty much kept Fate Bolt in waves. His team couldn't really fight with Void being weak and Oats being on cooldown, so note how he would always, with the passive on aggressive mode, Fate Bolt the range creep. After 15 minutes, you cannot one shot range creeps with Fate Bolt anymore, but thanks to getting close enough so that the passive affects them, he would always get two CS the melee creep that was dying and the range creep. That repeats itself for a pretty long time until this smoke kick. No the Dire just Roche, but considering the enemy team, there's like 90% of chance that Serpent Wards were used, and this is the timing that they want to abuse. Also, note how they smoke towards the creep wave that is pushing. This will give them the chance to find someone that will defend it, and with that stolen coil, he's able to take Shadow Shaman out of the fight right away. Again, note how he uses the stolen spell and steals something instantly. They burst the Shadow Shaman, but unfortunately the black hole gets cancelled. They get two, even though they wanted more, and this is another situation where Yapsur could choose to save himself or maybe suicide to help Core. Enigma is a Core, but Black Hole is on cooldown. Does that kill really matter? He's also super close to his Blink Dagger, and he decided to save himself. You can have your own opinions on whether Yapsur is worth more than Enigma in this particular situation, but opinions are not stronger than facts, and watch how he makes sure that the fact that he lives and lets Enigma die counts. He finishes his Blink Dagger and notices that Morphling is very low in HP, still farming in the lane. Not only that, Yapsur has Aether Shock and Fade Bolt with the aggressive aura and that deals a shit ton of damage. So he communicates with his visage that has birds around the area. He checks Morphling's HP and bam, he blinks in, breaks the Lincolns with ult, easy ages down, TPs out. Could Enigma achieve that without Black Hole? Pretty unlikely. And Dire's advantage and incoming push gets put into halt. Guys, I've loved making this Yapsur video, he's an insanely talented player, and while he's known for being a greedy player, I do feel like he did quite a bit with very little during this game. I would like to know from you guys if you want an extended video on the rest of this game, or if you would like different supports, please comment down below, and like the video if you like this. As of always, there's no way to actually know whether you guys like a certain format or a certain hero or the approach that I use, so I always love feedback, please let me know. This video is sponsored by Pugna and every single tutorial that they have has been updated to 7.11 and will be updated to 7.12 pretty soon, so make sure to check that out. There's a plethora of different videos 
and great players teaching you Dota and that will for sure increase your MMR if you keep on trying. Thanks for watching guys, this was a pleasure, bye.